Yo, so guys, welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to how the United States became the most powerful country in the world. And I'm assuming this is going to go through the history of different things that led it to have the power it is. Like, for example, World War, was it World War One or World War Two? where I think World War One, the US really, I guess, got rich off countries buying things. Like, I guess, foods and stuff, like, basically just products from the US. Maybe it's weapons as well, I'm not too sure. Uh, I think mainly the UK and like the allies of the the UK on this side, like France and stuff, buying things off the US and obviously they got rich off that. That obviously wasn't where it began, but just things like that. So things from beforehand as well, wars beforehand, different things from beforehand, winning wars, all this sort of stuff, obviously like gaining its independence. It probably it would have began from that, but then little things here and there. I hope it goes through all the history like that. Um, I'm assuming it will because it's quite a long video, but... Let's check this out and learn about it. But yeah, hopefully you're going to enjoy. Links are in the description to my Patreon if you want to see some more of my reactions that I can't post onto YouTube because they get copyrighted and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, let's check this out and learn, I guess, the history as well as how it became so powerful. Dawning of a new century. Getting the dawning of a new century. Getting to the 20th century for the United States of America took two wars with Great Britain, a civil war that killed over a million Americans, two presidential assassinations, and a whole lot of chaos. Surely history will calm down now, right? 1900s. As 1901 dawned, the McKinley administration oh, so starting from the 1900s. was beginning its second term. The pro-business imperialist Republican president had picked progressive New York Governor Theodore Roosevelt as his vice president, mostly to get him out of the way for the party bosses in New York. After all, the vice president doesn't actually have any power. So all McKinley had to do to keep him neutralized was stay alive. That shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, Leon Shogos had entered the chat. The radical anarchist ambushed McKinley at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo and shot him. McKinley survived the Damn. initial assassination, but just like President Garfield, that didn't mean he was out of the woods. His condition seemed to be improving, but eight days after the shooting, he succumbed to an infection. This was the third presidential assassination in 50 years, and more security... The third in 50 years? Jeez. This is an era for a lot of assassinations. For the president became a hot topic. Shogos was sentenced to death by electric chair, and Theodore Roosevelt was headed for the White House, and he would come to define the decade. Roosevelt was pro-business, but also pro-regulation, and he wanted to make sure the megacorps that were starting to form didn't grow out of control. He passed business reforms that were popular with his progressive base, but it didn't stop growth. This was the era when famous corporations like U.S. Steel, the Ford Motor Company, and Harley-Davidson were formed. The first World Series was played, and Roosevelt's international policy continued with McKinley's legacy of expansion. So you see baseball, right? In terms of sports, is baseball the most ingrained... This might be a really dumb question, because I feel like it is. Baseball is the most ingrained sport in like U.S. history and culture and stuff, because, I mean, the Super Bowl began in like the 60s, I think. Um, was it and when did the NFL begin? Actually, I'm just gonna. I, this is already a long video, but f whatever. When was the NFL created? Was it the same time as the Super Bowl was? Oh, so 1920. So the NFL was going on before. So how did the NFL work before? Was it still the same? It just wasn't called the Super Bowl, and then they've realized, okay, we can actually make a big thing from this this final game. Um, basketball, NBA, again. I know it's got a history, but I feel like baseball... Baseball goes into the 1800s. The, sorry, the 18th century, not 1800s. Like that is history beyond imagination, you know. The U.S. acquired the Panama Canal Zone. Oklahoma became a state, and Roosevelt was seen as a wildly successful president. The former outcast was overwhelmingly re-elected, but there would come to be some rough waters ahead. Yep. Racial equality and women's suffrage were both major topics, with new groups forming to advocate for their rights. America suffered two huge disasters in a two-year period, with a massive earthquake in San Francisco and a devastating coal mine explosion in West Virginia. The FBI and Department of Commerce and Labor were both founded under Roosevelt. Diplomatic relations with really? oh, wow. Japan were opened, and Roosevelt's second term was a big success, enough for his Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, to easily win the 1908 election. Taft was a laid-back man who mostly continued with Roosevelt's policies and leveraged America's wealth overseas as opposed to its military force. The NAACP was formed under his tenure, but he would soon hit some major stumbling blocks because his mentor wasn't done just yet. 1910s. 
Taft's presidency was dominated by economic and labor affairs. More reforms were passed, and the Supreme Court broke up the massive Standard Oil Corporation in 1911. That same year, the horrible Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York killed 146 garment workers, bringing new attention to the plight of the working class. New Mexico and Arizona were admitted as states, the Girl Scouts were founded, and the sinking of the Titanic, taking over 2,000 passengers with it, shocked the world. But this next election was going to be the craziest. Was the, no, was the Titanic sinking? Obviously, it's massive. Everyone knows about it now. It's just the no, like the most known disaster out at sea. But when it first happened, would it have been world news or would it have been used in like the US and the UK? Because I think it set off from Southampton in the UK. And obviously, I feel like a lot of the people on board were from the US, and it was obviously near near the US and Canada as well. Was it worldwide news at the first, like when they first found out about it, or was it just sort of news in just a few Western countries? I mean, it probably was. It became more well known over time. That's how it sort of went. But when it first happened, I'm sort of wondering how it would have been. I don't know if anyone will actually know that because no one from that time is going to be alive anymore. But yet, Taft was largely seen as respectable but ineffectual and had lost much of his support from the party. Roosevelt founded his own Bull Moose Party while the Democrats nominated the little-known New Jersey governor, Woodrow Wilson, who had been a college president only two years before. Roosevelt even survived an assassination attempt on the campaign trail, but the split vote made it easy for Wilson to win the election, and the Democrats returned to the presidency for only the third time since the Civil War and he would be a big change in direction. Under Wilson, the income tax and direct election of the U.S. Senators was established, the Federal Trade Commission was formed, the first assembly line was created by Henry Ford, and movies became much more popular, with the introduction of the racist Southern revisionist film The Birth of a Nation. But Wilson's term would be dominated by foreign affairs, as World War I broke out in Europe, soon pulling the entire continent in. Wilson was more isolationist than his predecessors and vowed to avoid a major war. Even when 128 Americans were killed in the German sinking of the British ship RMS Lusitania, Wilson stayed fast, even campaigning for re-election with the slogan, he kept us out of war. He won a narrow victory over Charles Hughes in the same election where the first woman, Jeanette Rankin, was elected to Congress. But his campaign promise wasn't to be. Not long after his election victory, the Zimmerman telegram was intercepted. This was a message where the German Empire promised to help Mexico reclaim lost territory if they assisted them against the Americans. That was Jeez. enough, and the U.S. entered World War I in 1917. It would be the most brutal war in the country's history yet, with a massive draft sending over 2 million men abroad to fight. Over 100,000 ultimately died, and things were rough on the home front as well. The Espionage and Sedition Acts sent many anti-war activists to prison, and Wilson cracked down on the communist movement in what would become the first Red Scare. If you're thinking all this calls for a stiff drink, think again! Prohibition was sweeping the nation, with alcohol banned in 29 states. 1918 would see the end of the war, but not the end of chaos. Republicans won back Congress right before the war ended, as change was in the air. Countless people celebrated the end of the war, right before the Spanish flu pandemic hit the US and killed over half a million Americans. Spanish flu isn't really spoken about much, but it was one brutal ass, like, illness, or flu, or whatever. Like, the actual strength of it, if that happened in the current day, that would cause, like, tens of millions of people to die, wouldn't it? probably more than that. I swear it was a really high like death rate once you caught it. Shortly after signing the Treaty of Versailles and while planning the founding of the League of Nations, Wilson was felled by a major stroke that incapacitated him. But he didn't leave office. Rather, his wife Edith essentially ran his affairs for the rest of his presidency, leading many people to consider her the unofficial first female president. But it didn't go so well. Congress rejected both the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, although they did pass an amendment banning alcohol nationwide as the Age of Prohibition began. Baseball fans had reason to drink as the World Series was marred by cheating in the Black Sox scandal. The 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote was finally passed, and the economy went through another collapse just in time for an election, which led to the election of Republican Warren G. Harding. The 1920s would start off slow but go out with an economic bang. 1920s. Warren G. Harding was a little-known Ohio senator when he won the presidency, and he didn't seem to want to be a transformative president. He quietly signed separate treaties with the aggressors in World War I and appointed many of his allies and friends to powerful positions. He was seen as an extremely pro-business president, maybe too pro-business. He seemed uninterested in race issues, as a horrible race riot targeting an affluent black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma didn't gather much of a response. He was too busy engaging in blatant acts of patronage, plotting to sell off U.S.S 
assets to private oil companies, but he wouldn't be held accountable for it. Harding suddenly died in 1923 of a heart attack, just as the scandal was being exposed. Several of his cabinet officials went to prison in the aftermath, and his administration, already seen as hostile to labor interests, convenient timing for him, was seriously tarnished. He was replaced by his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, a mild-mannered Massachusetts governor nicknamed Silent Cal. He earned praise for his support of racial equality, including granting citizenship to Native Americans, but he strictly regulated immigration. Under him, J. Edgar Hoover became director of the Bureau of Investigation, kicking off a decades-long career. Coolidge was easily elected to a full term, and his second term was largely calm. Charles Lindbergh successfully flew across the Atlantic. The first talkie motion picture was released, and the first Disney cartoon came out. But was there a ticking the time bomb in the work? In the 1920s, Disney were doing flipping hell. It's crazy to think that's over 100 years that they've been making cartoons for. Coolidge's tenure was calm and he was well liked, but his hands off approach to economic affairs meant that banks were making risky investments. When it came time for the next election, Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover won an easy victory over the first Catholic nominee, Al Smith. Hoover's vice president, Charles Curtis, was a Native American conservative and the first person of color ever elected to a federal executive role. But less than a year into his presidency, a massive stock market collapse hit. Countless people lost everything. Banks collapsed and took people's life savings with them. And Hoover was seen as caught flat-footed by the whole thing. Democrats took back the Congress by massive margins in 1930, and the first half of Hoover's presidency ended with him reeling. America was about to enter its most consequential decade in a long time. 1930s. Herbert Hoover tried to dig the U.S. out of the Great Depression, but many of his attempts to help the economy, like vetoing a bonus for World War I soldiers, were deeply unpopular. Many Americans were desperate for help, struggling to find food for their family. This led to massive migration to cheaper areas of the country, as well as a boost in the popularity of socialism. Hoover seemed like a dead man walking electorally, and for the second time in the 20th century, America looked to a Roosevelt. The young progressive governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had survived a bout with polio and successfully hid his disability on the campaign trail. And what the hell? That is wild, because polio in these times was like really deadly, wasn't it? And was on his way to winning a massive electoral victory. But he almost didn't make it to the White House. Not long after his victory, a far-left gunman who thought Roosevelt was a moderate fired at him and killed the mayor of Chicago. That gave Roosevelt even more popular support when he took office, and he had big plans. With over 25% of Americans unemployed, he used his first 100 days to establish the New Deal, a massive social safety net that helped America recover from the Great Depression. Dozens of new government programs were established, the banks were reformed, and social security was introduced. He named the first female cabinet official Francis Perkins, and prohibition was repealed, saving the government a ton of money on enforcement. And that is wild how they, I can't get over that, how obviously getting the money involved, but how alcohol is banned. I understand the, the, the negatives to it, but in a country like, like the US where you can't drink alcohol, for what, a good 20 years it was banned? That is so fascinating to me and serving as a relief to many, no doubt. When the Supreme Court challenged many of his policies, Roosevelt threatened to appoint extra judges to overrule them. This failed, as even his allies balked at this new power grab, but several judges agreed to resign and give him a bigger say over the court. It was a busy time, and Roosevelt was seen as a massive success, but trouble was brewing. The first few years of Roosevelt's tenure were dominated by the battle to fix the economy, but abroad, things were changing fast. The Japanese Empire was waging a brutal war of conquest in Asia, and in Europe, the racist populist Adolf Hitler had taken control of Germany. In addition to persecuting the Jews, he was quickly trying to take back territory lost in the First World War. But America wanted to stay out of these conflicts, and Germany... Bro, these Olympic Games are crazy, aren't they? I don't know, did they kill people who won the races? I don't think they did, right? They didn't do anything to the Olympians, unless maybe they were Olympians of Jewish descent or something. But to go to Germany, to Nazi Germany at this time, and have uh, have the ball. I say they have the balls because, I mean, you don't know if they're just going to massacre people just for winning who aren't German. And to have the balls to win, oh, crazy man. I've, I looked at, I think I saw footage on Twitter or something recently. It was just crazy to see. Even hosted the Olympics during this era with black American athlete Jesse Owens humiliating Hitler by winning on his turf. 
Roosevelt would be overwhelmingly re-elected to a second term, with Congress passing several acts designed to keep the U.S. out of a war despite German and Japanese provocations. The Hoover Dam and the Golden Gate Bridge would both be completed during this time period. Superman would make his comic book debut, and the Hatch Act was introduced to tackle political corruption. But everyone knew what was coming. In 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland and World War II was officially on. Most of America's close allies in Europe were either conquered by the Nazis or battling against them, so Roosevelt made the controversial decision to run for a third term. He instituted the first peacetime draft, which his opponent Wendell Wilkie supported, and cruised to another overwhelming victory. The 1940s would once again be defined by war. 1940s. As 1941 began, Roosevelt began supplying his allies with materials to help them fight the war while staying out of it directly. In Europe, Hitler seemed to be going mad by invading Russia, his former ally, and then Japan one-upped him in madness by attacking the U.S. military base at Pearl Harbor. To no surprise, this got the U.S. into the war immediately, and then they joined the European theater when Germany declared war. Soon, the U.S. turned its entire industrial production toward the war, and domestically, there were big changes as well. The draft ramped up, and a total of 16 million Americans went off to war. The Japanese American population was persecuted and sent to internment camps, and basic pro- The Japanese American population? What? War. The Japanese American population was persecuted and sent to internment camps, and basic products like sugar and gasoline were rationed. But the U.S. entry into the war would have a big impact. The struggling British war effort was boosted by American support, and the Japanese faced serious opposition in the Pacific. As the war ticked on, the Germans were put on their back foot. They lost territory after territory, and the Allied invasion of France in 1944 turned the tide. Roosevelt, still riding high, ran for an unprecedented fourth term over token opposition and won. After Hitler's death in a Berlin bunker and Germany's surrender. That's not allowed anymore, is it? Aren't you only allowed two terms max? Maximum. Four, to four terms in a row? I guess the laws maybe changed, or is it. Wait, I don't know how that even managed to happen. Or is it you have to, you can have two terms in a row, but then if you go, if you're like, so after your two terms, you then can't be the president, but then after those terms are from, from those presidents are done, you can then have the possibilities of being the president again, maybe? I don't know. Render, the US turned their full attention to a war in the Pacific. Now it was time to win the peace. Roosevelt, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin met to carve up the post-war world at Yalta. But Roosevelt would not live to see the end of the war. He died of a stroke less than a year into his fourth term oh. and was succeeded by his VP Harry Truman. Truman would turn his full attention to the war in the Pacific, and the war would come to an end with two massive bombs detonating over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The nuclear age had begun, and the United Nations would form in the aftermath. Now it was time to deal with the consequences of the conflict on the home front, as the war had led to stiff inflation, and now millions of young men, many of them injured or traumatized, were returning. Truman did a good job with overseeing the recovery of Europe, and he desegregated the armed forces, but America seemed ready for a change. Was Governor Thomas Dewey really the favorite in 1948? It turns out, no. The election was seen as such a sure thing that papers printed Dewey defeats Truman headlines, which made one heck of a photo op for the victorious President Truman. But as the 1940s ended, good news like Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in baseball were overshadowed by the growing presence of communism. The Soviets tested their first atomic bomb, becoming the second nuclear nation. China fell to the communists, and the Cold War was on. What lay ahead in the 1950s? 1950s. The final days of the Truman presidency would be dominated by fear over communism. Senator Joseph McCarthy began a crusade to root out communists in America, targeting many prominent Hollywood figures. When a civil war broke out in Korea between communists and Western-aligned military figures, the U.S. got involved and helped to lock down a two-state system that exists to this day. Truman barely survived an assassination attempt by two radical Puerto Rican independence activists, and the 22nd Amendment limited the president to two terms, no more Roosevelt's. But it was clear the country was ready for a change. In 1952, the charismatic war hero General Dwight D. Eisenhower followed in the footsteps of Ulysses S. Grant, picking the staunch anti-communist Richard Nixon as his VP. He easily won over Adlai Stevenson and began an era of prosperity for the country. 
This was the era known as the baby boom. As post-depression and World War II birth rates skyrocketed, families gathered around the TV as that became the primary form of entertainment, and the fear of communism led to interventions abroad, such as a coup in Iran that would haunt the country for decades. But there was progress as well. The civil rights movement was picking up steam after the war, and the Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court ruling put an end to segregated schools once the southern states were forced to comply. Other flashpoints like the murder of young Emmett Till and Rosa Parks' bus protest would kick off the movement that would build for the next decade. The polio vaccine put an end to a terrifying plague, Disneyland opened, and Elvis Presley began his rise to fame. Eisenhower was easily re-elected in 1956 as the good times rolled and the first Civil Rights Act of the era was passed in 1957. But international affairs were about to put a stop to the fun and games. The space race kicked off when the Soviets launched the Sputnik satellite, the first man-made object in orbit. The Civil War in Vietnam and the Cuban Revolution brought some more communist governments to power, and the U.S. officially completed its growth, with the addition of Alaska and Hawaii as states. Eisenhower was still popular, but Nixon was less so, and in the 1960 election he was up against the charismatic Irish Catholic Senator John F. Kennedy, who beat the vice president in the closest election in the 20th century. The 1960s would be very different. 1960s. Kennedy took office alongside his vice president, Texas rival Senator Lyndon B. Johnson. Eisenhower had recently broken off diplomatic relations with Fidel Castro's Cuba, and this would become a flashpoint for his presidency. A failed invasion and coup in Cuba embarrassed the administration and was followed by a trade embargo, and only a year later the U.S. would come close to nuclear war when the Soviet Union placed nuclear missile facilities in Cuba. But Kennedy would have big wins in the space program, with Alan Shepard becoming the first American in space and John Glenn following in his footsteps as the first American to orbit the Earth. The civil rights leader Martin Luther King would give an inspiring speech known as I Have a Dream in a massive rally in Washington that would send the movement into overdrive. But the 60s were about to turn bloody. In it's 50s to 60s and like the P series or the areas of like people fighting for their freedoms and their rights and stuff. So you went from like the world wars, all these wars, um, the depression, and I guess that stuff kind of got sorted. I say sorted, I mean it ended it was still a tragedy and all this sort of stuff but they got past that and then it led to like the these all these different types of movements so yeah from the 50s and the 60s this is like the seems like the most progressive decades probably well, so far but probably ever right in 1963 john f kennedy was assassinated oh, no. by Lee. yeah there's so much happening this is just a little brief overview as well. Lee Harvey Oswald with a sniper rifle. Oswald would be killed by a mob-connected nightclub owner the next day, spawning decades of speculation. Lyndon B. Johnson took office amid national mourning and rose to the challenge, passing major economic reforms known as the Great Society, as well as a massive civil rights act that ended many forms of discrimination, including segregation. It wasn't a surprise when he was easily elected president by a massive margin the next year, although growing U.S. involvement in Vietnam had people worried. He was riding high, but it wouldn't last. As more U.S. soldiers were deployed to Vietnam, anti-war protests started ramping up on college campuses. Johnson's commitment to civil rights was impressive as he signed Major Voting Rights Act and appointed the first black judge to the Supreme Court. But it didn't stop increased racial tensions, which led to riots around the country, and then came the wave of assassinations that shocked the world. First was civil rights activist Malcolm X, followed by the inspirational Martin Luther King Jr. As the 1968 election approached, Johnson decided not to seek re-election due to his poor approval ratings, and now the race was in chaos. The Democratic National Convention was besieged by anti-war activists, which played right into the hands of the returning Richard Nixon, who was victorious and promised to take the fight right back to the communists. And his first year in office would be eventful. Nixon recommitted the U.S. to Vietnam, seeking to turn the South Vietnamese Army into a sustainable fighting force. The Stonewall riots in New York kicked off the modern gay rights movement, and the entire world watched as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to walk on the moon. As the decade ended, Sesame Street premiered on TV. Surely, <laughs> Sesame Street, goddamn. The 1970s would be less chaotic, right? 1970s. The century would start with the Kent State shootings that saw several student protesters die at the hands of the National Guard. 1970. What? I don't know about this. The National Guard killed people for protesting. What is the. I don't know anything about this, but that sounds insane just to think of. The N71 also saw a shocking flood of celebrity deaths, with Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Jim Morrison all dying of drug overdoses at age 27. 
oh, this is where the whole 27, I don't know what the actual thing is called, but 27 and celebrities, like, there's like a, it's just a famous number, isn't it, for that sort of stuff. The voting age was officially lowered to 18, and Richard Nixon became the first president to visit communist China. He was a heavy favorite to win re-election, winning a shocking 49 states over staunch liberal George McGovern. 49. No one paid too much attention to the break-in at the Watergate office complex at the time. But Nixon's second term would be very different from his first. 1973 saw several major events, including the Roe v. Wade ruling legalizing abortion and the U.S. ending direct involvement in Vietnam. Then Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned in disgrace over a corruption scandal just as the government started investigating the break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters at Watergate. As more evidence of Nixon's direct involvement came out, Nixon started firing his attorney generals to protect himself. While the U.S. suffered under an Arab oil embargo, a House committee voted to impeach Nixon, and he resigned in disgrace, leading Damn. to his appointed Vice President Gerald Ford taking over. Ford chose to pardon Nixon, ending that affair and causing no shortage of anger. And of course, it's going to give your friend a little bit of help, aren't you? That would spell his own political end. The Democrats controlled Congress and they led the way to a full withdrawal from Vietnam, resulting in the fall of Saigon not long after. Ford was nearly assassinated by two women within a 17-day period. Microsoft and Apple were both founded a year apart, and Americans celebrated their bicentennial. But as the election dawned, Ford seemed like a dead man walking. He barely won renomination over the charismatic conservative Ronald Reagan, limping into the general election. While the election was closer than expected, he lost his re-election to Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter, becoming the only president to never be voted into office by the public. And Carter's tenure wouldn't be any smoother. As the 39th president, he would oversee an economic crisis, a massive blackout in New York in 1977, and have some success in international affairs. He successfully negotiated peace between Israel and Egypt, and the Senate voted to turn over the Panama Canal to Panama in 20 years' time. But in 1979, the crisis that would define his presidency began. An Islamic fundamentalist coup in Iran led to a hostage crisis at the U.S. Embassy that lasted over a year, coinciding with an they had hostages for a year, what? Another energy crisis. Carter was seen as ineffectual, and his decision to boycott the 1980 Olympics in response to a Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia only made him more so. Much like Ford, Carter faced a fierce renomination battle from Ted Kennedy, and then was roundly defeated for re-election by Ronald Reagan. Who's ready for the 80s? 1980s. Ronald Reagan took office the same day that the hostages were released by Iran, an incident that some still find suspicious to this day. Hell? Many people feared the arch-conservative's new policies, but he almost didn't get to achieve any of them when he was seriously wounded by deranged assassin John Hinckley only two months after taking office. Reagan survived his wounds thanks to modern surgical techniques, Hinckley went to a mental institution, and Reagan was back at the Oval Office desk, signing tax cuts, firing striking air traffic controllers, and appointing Sandra Day O'Connor as the first woman on the Supreme Court, but soon his presidency would be dominated by foreign affairs. Tensions rose once again with the Soviet Union under Reagan, and a deadly suicide bombing killed 241 U.S. Marines in Lebanon. The U.S. also invaded Grenada amid political chaos in the island nation and created the Strategic Defensive Initiative missile system to fend off nuclear missiles. Reagan was controversial, but his tough approach to foreign threats won him a lot of support, so it wasn't surprising when he and his vice president George Bush were re-elected in a landslide over Carter's VP Walter Mondale. But his second term would be rockier than the first. Concerns over Reagan's age were growing, and it seemed the president was a little out of it. Amid this, the Iran-Contra scandal involving illegal arms sales to Iran that benefited a far-right group in Nicaragua broke. The country was shocked when the Challenger space shuttle exploded shortly after taking off, killing everyone on board. But probably the biggest change was in the Soviet Union, where the previous hardline Soviet leaders were replaced by Mikhail Gorbachev, who tried to liberalize the country and bring an end to the Cold War. Ironically, it would be Cold Warrior Reagan who would preside over the Great Thaw in relations. The two even signed a treaty reducing their nuclear stockpiles. Reagan was more than ready for retirement, but who was next? More than two terms for a party is rare, and Bush was seen as an underdog to Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis. But when Dukakis was painted as soft on crime, Bush scored a massive victory and continued Reagan's legacy. His early presidency would be dominated by the environmental catastrophe of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, increased law enforcement against drugs, and a continuing thaw in relations with the Soviets. But as the 1990s approached, some big events were on the horizon. 1990s. 
When Saddam Hussein of Iraq invaded the oil-rich nation of Kuwait, the U.S. was at war again. They joined 34 nations to fend off Saddam's invasion, but the Iraqi dictator was left in power, something that would be followed up on later. That same year, communist hardliners attempted to topple Gorbachev from power in Russia, but were fended off by the pro-democracy forces, leading the Soviet Union to collapse entirely. These foreign policy successes were enough to make Bush a heavy favorite for re-election. Or so it seemed. 1992 was a rough year. Race riots in Los Angeles and hurricanes in Hawaii and Florida scared many people. When Bush went back on his promise not to raise taxes, he lost much of his support. Texas billionaire Ross Perot waged an independent campaign for the presidency, but he largely split the vote in favor of the Democratic nominee, a young Arkansas governor named Bill Clinton, who had gone from obscurity to White House in just over a year. And Clinton's presidency would be, um, interesting. From the beginning, Clinton faced fierce opposition. He was accused of sexual harassment on the campaign trail, and he and his wife Sheesh. Hillary had their real estate dealings scrutinized. From the start, he was tested by foreign and domestic threats. A terrorist attack struck the parking garage of the World Trade Center in New York, killing six people, and a brutal standoff with a cult in Waco, Texas left 81 people dead. Earthquakes and storms killed hundreds, and a 1995 massive terror bombing in an Oklahoma City federal building killed 168 people. Was America entering a new dark age? It became clear that while Oklahoma City was the work of a homegrown terrorist, many of the others were committed by radical Muslim terrorists from abroad. Amid more bombings, including a smaller attack at the Summer Olympics in Atlanta, Clinton was easily re-elected. He was still popular, but he was about to face his biggest challenge yet when he was accused of having a sexual relationship with the White House intern Monica Lewinsky. It's Jesus Christ, is he not still with Hillary Clinton now? Oh, God. It sounded like a tabloid scandal, but the Republicans weren't laughing. And when he lied about the relationship under oath, he was impeached. Only the second president ever to be impeached by the full House. He was ultimately acquitted by the Senate, but his administration would be defined by it. But hey, look at that calendar! The year 2000 was almost upon us, and scientists worked round the clock to prevent the Y2K bug from knocking all computer systems for a loop. An attack on the USS Cole, a naval destroyer, was the latest strike by the terror group Al-Qaeda, led by Osama bin Laden, a Saudi radical angry about the US presence in the Middle East. And it was almost election time, which would pit Clinton's VP Al Gore against George W. Bush, the son of the man Clinton defeated. America watched oh, wow. and waited for the results, and waited as the election came down to several hundred votes in Florida. Both sides sued to have the recount conducted there. How can it be so close? That is wild. How can it be such a fine split? Airway, and ultimately the Supreme Court stepped in and ruled in Bush's favor, essentially making him the president-elect. One person who enjoyed that election night more than anyone? Hillary Clinton, who ran for and won a Senate seat while still first lady. A new millennium, a new start? 2000s. The early days of Bush's presidency seemed surprisingly calm, with the president focusing on election reform. And then, eight months after taking office, the world changed. Four hijacked planes destroyed the World Trade Center in New York and hit the Pentagon in Washington, while the fourth crashed into an empty Pennsylvania field. In total, 3,000 Americans were killed in what turned out to be a massive strike by Osama bin Laden. The more I know, I didn't even know the fourth plane, but I just learn more about it every day. I knew there was two attacks, but then this one as well. Flipping hell, man. Field. In total, 3,000 Americans... How did they manage to just get four planes hijacked at the same time? That is so fishy. Americans ...were killed in what turned out to be a massive strike by Osama bin Laden against the heart of America. Only days later, packages containing deadly anthrax started showing up in mailboxes, although this would turn out to be unrelated. In response to the attacks, Bush passed a series of anti-terror acts and launched a major military operation against Afghanistan, where bin Laden was hiding under the protection of the radical Taliban government. The 2000s would be defined by the September 11, 2001 attacks. America continued to be haunted by the terror attacks, and a series of sniper attacks around D.C. ramped up the tension. The Republicans regained control of the Senate, and in 2003, Bush asked Congress to authorize the invasion of Iraq to take Saddam Hussein out of power once and for all. He claimed Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, although they were never found. But many assume Saddam's attempt to kill his father in the 1990s might have been a factor as well. Saddam was deposed from office and captured less than a year into the war, but the U.S. would be fighting loyalists there for many years. Bush's decision to invade Iraq was controversial, but he would narrowly win re-election in 2006 over John Kerry. Maybe Kerry was overshadowed by a charismatic young state senator named Barack Obama, who spoke at the convention. 
But Bush's second term would not be what he was hoping for. Tension over the Iraq war continued to grow as anti-war forces condemned it. A massive hurricane in New Orleans devastated the city and Bush's team was condemned for their slow response. The Democrats took back Congress in 2006, with Nancy Pelosi becoming the first female Speaker of the House. And as 2008 rolled around, a massive recession and stock collapse devastated the economy. It seemed the Democrats had it in the bag. The favorite candidate was Hillary Clinton, who had been building her network for years. But she was shockingly upset in the primary by Barack Obama, who emphasized his opposition to the Iraq War. And in the 2008 election, Obama easily won, becoming the first black president of the United States. But would he be up to the task of fixing the country's many problems? For Obama's first two years, he had a filibuster-proof trifecta and used it to pass massive economic stimuli and health care reform. He passionately advocated for racial justice, but his opponents considered him a radical. Massive Tea Party protests around the country formed to oppose him. Republicans took back the House of Representatives in the next election, and Obama's agenda seemed to be stalled, as the former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney consolidated support to become the next U.S. President. Obama seemed to be on the ropes, until one day in 2011 when he announced that U.S. Special Forces had finally killed Osama bin Laden. This led to a massive boost in support for the Obama administration, and he and VP Joe Biden were handily re-elected in 2012. And Obama's second term. Obviously, Joe Biden was Obama's vice president. See, it's always weird. It's always vice presidents who then become presidents. But so been um, he's so much younger. Biden's so much older. Obama's so much younger. But he was the president at the time. Fair enough. It's Obama. Obama feel, I feel like he's one of the younger presidents that there's been because they always seem so much older, like seventies, eighties. I mean, recently they've been older. I mean, Trump seventies, Biden's in his eighties. I think Trump's nearly 80 as well now, but he was in his 70s when he became president. Obama, I don't know how old he is now, he's probably like mid-50s, but he would have been, what, 40s at the time maybe? Around that sort of age? Would be as eventful as his first. A terror attack on the Boston Marathon shocked the country, and Hurricane Sandy devastated the eastern seaboard. Gay marriage was federally legalized by the Supreme Court, and the shooting death of Michael Brown in Missouri led to nationwide protests against police brutality and what would become the Black Lives Matter movement. Amid it all, Obama remained a steady but controversial figure, coming down strongly in favor of civil rights and change as the 2016 election neared. And that election would surely be business as usual, right? Wait, who's that coming down the staircase? <laughs> Want to know more about- Oh, we just ended it there. Oh, okay. I guess that was Trump, right? It just ended it there. I believe <coughs> I believe American involvement in World War Two was the turning point that pushed it to become the superpower it is today. Its industrial production was unparalleled. Another factor was its ability to fight in two different fronts, the European theatre and the Pacific and coming out on top in both. Being the first nation to have a nuclear bomb certainly didn't hurt either, yeah. That's a fair point. It's crazy that there's going to be a video like this breezing through our history in a hundred years' time, yeah. But this is an interesting look into how the United States became the powerful country or the most powerful country in the world. And yeah, hopefully you found this interesting. And yeah, until next time, like, subscribe. Peace.